Hey everybody, Ian, thanks for joining me this evening. This evening we're going to be looking at triggers. So quick hello to everyone and looking at triggers. When we talk about triggers, um, I think it's important to recognize what we actually mean by a trigger. Sometimes a trigger can be a stimulus, something that brings something up in us. Other times, and this is something I'm going to be looking at in, in, uh, in the session tonight, a trigger can actually be something that someone implants in us, like a button to push. I think it's important to recognize those as well. A lot of people that, that come on my channel, they've been in difficult relationships, they've been in toxic relationships, and there may have been things that person does or says that brings certain things up on us. So when it comes to triggers, I think it's important to know what a trigger is, know how to identify it, better chance of maybe diffusing it then or avoiding it if we have to, how people plant those triggers into us. In other words, again, as I said, the buttons say know how to push and how to deal with it more effectively. Now, so I often say this is a lot easier if you're doing it, you're not necessarily doing it alone. You could be doing it in a support group. You'd be working with other people. You could be doing it in therapy. You could be working with a life coach. It's going to be a lot easier. All I can really do is give an outline. But I hope you find this evening interesting. So when you think of a trigger, it's like I say, it's like an emotional stimulus and it brings something up in us. It brings, if you will, an emotional memory, something that something that's had an impact on us. Now, well, often we think of a trigger as something disturbing. And it more often than not, whether it's trauma, abuse, things like that, difficult situations we've been through, it can be. But we can be triggered in many different ways. We can be triggered in ways that are incredibly exciting. We can be triggered in ways that make us laugh. We can be triggered, we could be triggered with boredom. You know, if, if, you, if you don't like the ironing, if you don't like the laundry, if you don't like doing housework, every time you look at that pile of laundry, you're going to be triggered by boredom. You know, you don't really want to do it. So we get triggered in, in different ways. It's recognizing the different kinds of triggers. Now, I'm going to very quickly just go through the different kinds of triggers. There are internal triggers. In other words, we will get a very strong feeling about something. And that very strong feeling could be based on a past experience. Again, it could be something exciting. It could be something threatening. It could be, it could be a lot of different things. You think of someone maybe at work, they raise their voice. That might bring up a memory, an emotional memory. You might remember maybe being about 10 years of age and you're at school and the teacher's giving you a hard time. So there's that kind of internal, the strong feeling. Sometimes it comes over as like a wave. Sometimes it might be stimulated by something else. There's trauma-related triggers. Now, there are very strong reactions to something. And I think a lot of the time, when we have a trauma-related trigger, it's almost like there's part of us kicks in. It feels as if yesterday's threat is present today. Yesterday's situation is present today. I am right back there. And we often find ourselves acting the way we did back at that time period. There are physical triggers, symptoms, if you will. For instance, if you've had a few nights of insomnia, you're not getting a lot of sleep. So you're going to get very tired. You'll feel a lot of fatigue. And that brings up a loss of energy, which can sometimes trigger a low mood. So there are physical triggers as well. But one way or another, more often than not, the trigger is something external. It's something that happens outside of us that reminds us, okay, again, yesterday's situation is present today. And it's a sensory thing. So it could be a sight, it could be a sound, it could be a touch, it could be a smell, it could be a taste. One way or another, we hear a song, for example, and that reminds us of someone we used to know, perhaps when we were at school. So we don't just remember the person. We don't just remember the song. We remember what it felt like to be at school. And we remember how we felt when we were with that person. If we had a crush on them or if they bullied us. We might taste something. And it reminds us of our childhood. It's something that granny used to make. So we'll have different kinds of external triggers. It is, it's a sensory thing. And it reminds us of something from the past, okay? 
when you meet someone, and it could be someone you've never met before, but they do or say something, they behave in a certain way, or they might look a certain way. And that could remind us of someone from our past. It could remind us of our dad, it could remind us of a teacher, it could remind us of an ex-partner, could remember of an old boss we had. There will be something about them. Sometimes we can't put our finger on it, but there might be something about them that reminds us, okay? So there are many different kinds of triggers. As I say, they're usually external. Sometimes they might come over as like a wave or they might be a physical thing. But recognizing the different kinds of stimulus, that's often the trigger. The trigger itself is the external thing. What that brings up is the emotional reaction, okay? In order to deal with the emotional reaction, there's different ways of looking at that. We understand what it is we're actually feeling. To deal with the trigger itself, it's to recognize what that actually brings up on us. And I'm going to go through that as, as the evening progresses. Some of our triggers we can't always avoid. I think by their very nature, they, they're just triggers. They sometimes just happen. And some triggers might be worth avoiding. It could be something very unpleasant. It could be something deeply disturbing. We really don't want to get into a really deep argument with somebody. We really don't want to get into trouble with someone. We don't want something that's going to be painful, so we try to avoid it. Other times, a lot of what we're doing is just trying to avoid the feeling. For instance, you might have to have a difficult conversation with someone. You might have to tell them to stop doing whatever it is they're doing. Now, they might not know what they're doing is bothering you. But if you don't say to them, they're not going to know. And we keep putting that off because what we fear is what that might bring up. The trigger, if you will, is having to have that conversation. And what we're trying to do is avoid the uncomfortable feeling. But the more we avoid something, like I said this in the previous uh, live stream, the more we avoid something, sometimes the more frightening it becomes, the more difficult it becomes. And I'm going to illustrate what I mean when we avoid things. They often progress on to other things. They accumulate. So you imagine you were with someone and they may have treated you very badly. But when you were with them, when you first met, you might have danced to a song. It was a song that you, it was your favorite song. It was a song that two of you really got into. If you will, it was your song. Coming out of that, the best thing you ever could have done was get away. And maybe you've got away by the skin of your teeth. But every time you hear that song, it brings up the memory of that person. It reminds you of someone who was really, really hurtful to you. So every time that song comes on the radio, you turn the radio off. Every time it comes on to play, you leave the station, you turn it off, whatever it is, because you don't want to listen to it. It will remind you of a painful experience. But after a while, you're not just listening to that song anymore. It could be anything by that singer or anything by that band because that reminds you of what happened. Then after a while, it's not just that band. It could be anything from that era. It could be anything in that genre. The more we try to avoid things, the more we engage in, if you will, safety-seeking behavior, the more we're trying to avoid uncomfortable feelings. There's not necessarily anything wrong with avoiding uncomfortable feelings, but if we don't understand why they're uncomfortable, if we sometimes don't face the things we fear, the worse that it gets. Someone's just mentioned the cranberries. Yeah, I remember the cranberries. They're from my part of the world. Um, so yeah, what we do is we try to avoid. The more we, the difficult ones, now, very bad work environment. If we'd have grown up in a household that was, well, not ideal. It's not like we were like the Waltons, you know, but it might have been a difficult place. We were constantly bullied, put down and so on. If we were in a relationship with someone, often what we remember coming out of that, coming out of that, whether there's no contact, whether there's a breakaway, whatever it is, we left the job, we moved somewhere else. We're often left with the residual feelings. And it's those feelings every time they come up. Like I said earlier, I'm going to keep reinforcing this. It feels like we're right back there. 
one of the things we can do, and I'm going to address this a little later on, is looking at the ways that we update our memory. Okay? We update our memory. Yesterday's threat is yesterday. Yesterday's situation was yesterday. What is going on at the moment feels the same. It might look the same, and it could well be the same. But we have a bit more experience, a bit more wisdom. So it's how you address that. Now, going back to the, the, the idea of if we meet someone, someone who was really difficult, someone who was really painful. This is the thing about narcissistic people, which is the huge thing on my channel. A lot of people talk about narcissism. The huge thing about narcissism, some narcissists are just self-absorbed. That's all they are. They're just self-absorbed. It's all about me. I'm the important one here. But then there are those who are very, very cruel. It's not just about them. It's always about winning. It's always about controlling. It's always about domination. So whenever you meet someone, this is how they, if you will, they go about, for want of a better term, brainwashing us, conditioning us. When you first meet, if you remember, you were the most amazing person in the world. They thought you were incredible. They put you on this amazing pedestal. And when you get to know each other, you start to tell each other things. Now, you might be telling them things, things that frighten you, things that you're embarrassed about, things that you did in your past that you would rather not, rather, rather not have to go through again, things that really don't you know, make you feel good. You may tell them things, if you will, your dark secrets, but you also tell them your hopes. You tell them your aspirations, you tell them your dreams, because we share things like that. Um, they might be telling you things as well, but what they might also be telling you is they might be telling you some of the terrible things they have been through. Their ex-partner was a narcissist, by the way. You know, their father wouldn't talk to them. Their last boss was a bully. They have been through terrible, terrible ideals, terrible traumas in their lives. So you're sharing these things with each other. Now, as you're sharing these things, if you will, they're information gathering. They're finding out the things that excite you. They're finding out the things that frighten you. They're finding out the things that you're embarrassed about, you're ashamed of. What they're doing is they're finding little buttons to push at a later date. Because when you call them out on something, they have a button to push. When they want something from you, when they want you to do something for them, they have a button to push. They will play on your hopes. They will play on your fears. They will play on your shame. It's whatever button they need that gets them what they want. But also what they're doing is whenever you decide maybe you're going to have to call them out, you're going to have to say something to them, they have implanted in you all the terrible stuff they've been through. So what we're learning is to cut them a bit of slack. It's not them. It was their terrible ex did this to them. I'm left with the pieces. It's not them. It's the terrible condition they have. It's not them. It's, it's their whatever whatever's going on with them. So we start to feel sympathy, again, tapping into our empathy, drawing on our empathy. They use those things. Again, they're buttons to push. Now, it can be done in a very insidious way. It's not often people, I often say people talk about, why didn't I see the red flags? Because they're not waving them in front of you. They're done in very small, subtle ways. They could be in tears while they're telling you about this terrible thing that happened to them. And every time you upset them, you're remembering the tears. You're remembering the upset. You're remembering their trauma. You're remembering the awful things they go through. And the last thing we want to do is to be the person who hurts someone who is already hurt. It is quite insidious, isn't it? <laughs> but what they're also looking at is whenever you bring up something, whenever you're saying no, whenever you assert a boundary, they are reminding you of the things you have shared with them. For example, they might accuse you of cheating, 
accuse you of lying, demanding access to your phone, your social media, whatever it is. And you have to prove your innocence by giving it to them. And you could be putting up a bit of a fight. You could be saying, no, you're not getting that. You know, there's private stuff on that. I have conversations with people that have nothing to do with you. Then they might bring up something like, what about that time you lied to your parents? You broke the window and you blamed your brother. So the reminding when you were 10 years of old, old, you told a lie. And that's evidence of your lying today. That's evidence of your badness today. Or the time you did something and it really didn't work out for you. It blew up in your face. And you're trying to do something. They will bring that up. You don't know what you're doing. You need me. I need to make these decisions for you. Look at what happened when you tried to. Each and every time they're pushing these little buttons to get us to back down. When we do call them out on something or when we do say, no, we assert it, but we start maybe asserting boundaries or we start planning to leave. They'll start to behave. They've been behaving like this the whole way by the time. But they will behave as you're saying no, as the most horrible thing anybody could ever do. It is selfish. It is unkind. It is cruel. How could you after all they've done for you? How could you after all they've had to go through? They are trying their damnedest to make this work. And all you do is keep bringing up all this stuff. What they're doing is they're playing on your guilt. Because they have found out along the way, because of your empathy and things like that, the last thing you want to do is hurt. So they're going to be playing on your guilt. And what we do, again, is we tend to back down. Maybe I should give them a, another chance. Before you know, they've had about two or three hundred second chances. But nothing changes. And every time you bring it up, yet again, it's not them. It's their issues. It's their trauma. It's their whatever. They play as well. Again, they're planting little things as well. Along the way, you might have heard things like, I was speaking to somebody and I was telling them about that time you did and they couldn't believe or they can't believe you'd be that kind of person. They were shocked when they heard that you were. Now, they might never have had that conversation at all. But what they're doing is they're playing on your self-esteem. Remember, self-esteem is not so much what I think of me. It's what I think others think of me. They're playing on that. They are playing on your if you will, your, your, your fear of other people's opinion, public opinion. They're, they're playing on your embarrassment. And the more they do that, again, we start to back down. Each and every time they do this, we often find ourselves doing the same thing. We back down, we, we compromise, we give in, we give yet another chance. We don't do what's in our best interest because as they're pushing those buttons, we're getting triggered. Okay, so be mindful of the triggers. That person, might, if you, there might have to be some kind of contact with them. You'll probably find they keep doing the same kinds of things. Each and every time you're with them, you might have left them a long time ago, but each and every time you have to see them, it feels as if you're right back there. There's part of you that feels as if it's stuck. Remember, yesterday's threat is still present today. Now, physically, they may well be because they are in the same room. But not necessarily so. Because again, and I'm going to come back to this, it's about how we update our memory to be able to manage those triggers. The term is often called, just called gaslighting. What they're doing when they're implanting these triggers is they are gaslighting. They are rewriting your narrative. What other people think of you is much more important than fact. It's much more important than reality. What I'm saying to you is much more important than reality. What you think of yourself. We're often led to believe. We're often led to believe the other person knows things about us we don't. It's almost like they can see into your soul. It's almost like they can read your mind. They, they know your motives. And if you've been in that situation for a long time, this is why I use the term brainwashing. We sometimes get brainwashed to believe 
that they actually can. Now, even though there's part of us knows this is absolute nonsense. I was about to say another word there, but YouTube probably would have demonetized me if I had of. Um, we know it's nonsense. We'll stick with the word nonsense. Even though there's part of us knows this is nonsense, the more we hear it, the more they keep saying it, the more it keeps getting ingrained into us. Now, coming out of that relationship, and this is not uncommon. This is not uncommon. We can find it hard to trust others. And probably quite rightly so, we're going to be a lot more cautious. But somebody might do or say something that sounds very similar. They're disagreeing with us. They're challenging us. They're disagreeing with our perspective. They're, they don't fully understand what we're talking about. And in some cases, you might get someone who is just as toxic. But other times, no, they're, they're curious. They they. They don't get it. They've never been in a situation like that. They don't know why someone would behave like that. But it's like we're triggered and we're right back there with the previous person. We're having to explain ourselves and we're jumping all over the place. We're trying to reword it in a way that they'll understand. We're, we're, we're trying to find evidence. We're trying to prove ourselves. We're trying to do this, that and the other. And the other person they probably don't know what's going on. We look as if we're crazy. We're not really. We've just been conditioned to overly explain ourselves. Other times, you might get someone who is every bit just as toxic. But we're still doing the same thing because every time we're triggered, remember, it's like yesterday's situation is present today. Yesterday's problem, yesterday's person is present today. We keep feeling as if we're right back there. And this is the thing about our triggers. If we don't learn them, if we don't understand them, if we don't recognize how they work, if you will, and what they bring up in us, we keep doing the same things again and again. Now, I've just mentioned some, I've just noticed someone's mentioned trust is an issue. Yes, trust is an issue. Especially if you were with someone who behaved as if they couldn't trust you well i would rephrase that no they wouldn't trust you maybe they did trust you but they'd like to gaslight you brainwash you lead you lead you to believe that you couldn't be trusted every word comes out of your mouth is a lie unless it's in black and white unless there's 75 witnesses unless they saw it for themselves unless they could peel open your head and see your thoughts yeah it's a lie Sometimes we find it hard to trust ourselves because again, we've been led to believe we can't make decisions. They know more than we do or other people are better at this than I am. Good, I think I made a, I made a video a, a while ago on self gaslighting. It's one of the, one of the, if you will, the symptoms, the effects of having been in a long-term abusive relationship. And self-gaslighting is that inner critic, which we all have, by the way. But it's that inner critic that is so loud. It's not our voice. It's the voice of the person that kept saying these things. We doubt ourselves. We we question ourselves. We, we second-guess ourselves, regardless of what it is. Whatever it is, it's not going to work for me. Whatever it is, I'm not going to be believed. Whatever it is, they are going to destroy me. They are much more powerful than me. That's not our voice. More often than not, that's the voice of the abusive person. But it's been so ingrained in us. It's still there. Well, for some reason, we're still listening to it. And that's what happens every time we're triggered. That voice comes up again. And we're right back there. Now, this is the thing about trust. It reminds me, I'm going to share this with you. This is probably a bit too tongue-in-cheek, but I, I hope you get what I'm saying. It was an old science fiction show that I used to watch. And... Uh, one of the people said to the guy, you know, on my planet, we have a saying. Someone who trusts can never be betrayed, only mistaken. And that sounds quite wise and all the rest of it. But the other guy replied, people on your planet must have a short life expectancy. You know, so I thought that was a good comeback for that. But <coughs> pardon me. Trust is something yes people have to earn trust just like we have to earn trust there is an element of trust that has to be earned but trust as well is something i think you give now it means taking a huge risk a huge gamble 
And we don't have to trust someone with our front door key. We don't have to trust them with our bank details. We don't have to trust them with, you know, something really huge. But we do trust on some level. And I think it's up to them to show us whether or not they deserve the trust. They let us down, then we learn they can't be trusted. If they continually let us down, then we know definitely don't trust them. But trust is a difficult one to deal with. I think the best way, and it's like any kind of character, there was a question on Twitter that came up. I don't do a lot on Twitter. I just put up little daft things every now and again or put out a video. That put. But there was a question came out, which I thought was a really, really good question. How do you know someone's character? And I have a lot of people were saying many different things. But what I'd said was, you just watch for repeated patterns of behavior. That's all. I don't think there's any, I don't think you can do more than that. Because someone can be angry, someone can be funny, someone can be flippant. That's not necessarily a reflection of their character. They could be having a good day, they could be having a bad day. You know, it could be anything going on. We all have days like that. It's not necessarily a reflection of their character. Repeated patterns of behavior, I think, are a good indication. If someone is continually letting you down, it's fair to say, maybe they can't be trusted. So, the other thing you might hear are the threats, the threats that you get. I'm going to tell other people about you. Just like I said earlier, I was having a conversation with someone and they said, the threat that I'm going to tell people about you, that's often a threat, again, on your character. They rely on you fearing other people's opinions. They might threaten to harm someone. They might threaten to harm themselves. Again, what they're doing, they're pushing that button. They're playing on your guilt. Now, I can't say whether they will or won't, by the way. Each case is, in, is, is different. And there's no telling what some people will do. But that's still, that's making you responsible for them, for their behavior. As they've probably taught or instilled in you throughout that relationship you are responsible for their moods you are responsible for their behavior and they did that through planting those little buttons in you planting that they can push so they can trigger you okay now i just changed this over when you do come out of that even after you're out of it you might find and i'm sure you're familiar with the term hoovering it's when they try to reel you back and you might hear things like i don't know what i did to hurt you but i'll always love you <laughs> you know if you how can you not know i've told you 500 bloody times but you still hear things like that and that's to try to reel you back to what you're remembering again pushing that button because they loved you when you first met you were the most amazing thing to them they might offer you the things that you were hoping for. You know, um, I was going to book that month in Rome. I was going to book a month in Rome for us. Now, you haven't spoken to them in about a month. You have nothing to do with them. And all of a sudden, they've decided they want a holiday in Rome to try to entice you back. Because who knows, maybe Rome was one of their... Uh, one of the things you would have liked to do. It's one of the places it was on your bucket list. It's somewhere you would have loved to have went to Rome. Or maybe you went to Rome and you had a really good time. So they're offering to take you back. Again, what they're doing is they're pushing those little buttons to try to trigger that memory of what it was like when things were really good between you. The good times you had. When you recognize those buttons that are being pushed, they become a little easier to deal with. I'm not so, Well, I'm not saying easy. I would say easier. It's that old expression, knowledge is power. Okay. Once, once, as I said in the video recently, once you see it, you can't unsee it. Now, when those triggers come, when you find yourself being triggered, sometimes we aren't going to see it. It comes out of nowhere. As I say, the song plays on the radio or we taste something or we, we hear something, we read something. We can't always avoid our triggers. Sometimes it is in our best interest to because they might be very unpleasant. But if we can't avoid them other times, maybe it's not a good idea because maybe we need to learn to 
become a bit more confident. We need to become a bit more courageous. We need to learn to understand what it is we're actually feeling. So when we find ourselves triggered, something that can be helpful is to, if you will, you do a quick check with yourself, a quick reality check. What I mean by that is you might do a little bit of grounding. Some people find meditations helpful, deep breathing exercises. You can learn these things in therapy. There's YouTube videos, there's podcasts, little things to help de-escalate the, uh, the intensity. It might even, whatever it is, it brings back flashbacks, memories of what actually happened. Again, these could be very distressing. I think someone mentioned last time about the flashbacks. Yeah, they can be very distressing. It's like we're reliving the thing. Now, when we're grounding ourselves, again, we're de-escalating. It gives us a little bit of space to actually pay attention to what it is we're actually feeling. We will say frightened. We will say terrified. We will say angry. We will say anxious. They're all good terms. But when you go that little bit deeper, I feel disrespected. I feel as if I'm being coerced. I feel uncertain. I'm feeling a lack of control here. When you get a sense of what it is you're actually feeling, what you can do is you can regulate it. Now, regulating it means it's not that you shouldn't feel it, but if you pay attention to it, it can help you to make a decision, not make the decision for you. You're not thinking, get me out of here, warp speed. You might be thinking, what's the best way through this? It feels similar, but it might not be the same. And this is what I mean by updating our memory. You could be in a work environment. There's someone in work and they're behaving the same way as your ex did. You could have a boss and they're behaving the same way as the last boss did. That's unpleasant and that's uncomfortable, but you're a little more informed. What didn't work last time? If it didn't work, can you rule it out? What do you think might like to be different? By the way, you don't always have to respond straight away. Okay, and this is the thing about grounding ourselves. You can go back to someone five minutes later, 10 minutes later. You could go back the following day. You could wait until the next meeting and then bring it up. You're under no obligation. Do you ever have one of those arguments? You ever talk to someone and five minutes later or even the following day, you're going, damn, I wish I'd have said. As if the moment's lost. It's not. We can go back anytime. We can bring that up. As I said, the next meeting might not be for a month. We bring it up at the next meeting. I was thinking about what, last, what happened last time. And then we address it. We're under no obligation to answer or to do anything straight away. A response doesn't always have to be immediate. If you will, we're giving ourselves a reality check. We're paying attention to what it actually felt. The other thing we're doing whenever we're grounding ourselves is we can recognize, is our reaction in proportion to what just happened? Sometimes it is. Sometimes it isn't. Now, it might have been about a month ago, I think, I did a live stream where I went through the ABC model. If you're not familiar with it, check that out because I do talk about it. Um, when you look at the ABC model, the A is what happened, the activating event. The B is the belief. What do you believe happened? Or what do you believe about yourself and your whole belief around the thing? The C was the consequence. What did you do next? So you can use that with hindsight. You can even use that in the moment, the more familiar you become with it. What is it's just happened? What is this bringing up in me? What does this actually mean? When we do that, we have a bit more control. We can change if you, if you want to change the word consequence, make it an outcome. What outcome would you prefer? You can also, I know it's the ABC model. I like the A to D, the D is dispute. Is it really the way I'm seeing it? Could there be a reasonable alternative or could there be a better outcome? The outcome I would prefer. You're giving yourself a sense of control. What you can also do is you actually check the facts. How much of this is fact? What actually happened? What part of this is fact and how much of this is feeling? It's not that one's right and one's wrong. It's just trying to get a balance. How you can feel very strongly about something. But that does not, as I said earlier, doesn't have to dictate the next course of action. You pay attention as to why it feels so strong and allow it to inform you.
You look at your beliefs around it, your perceptions around it. Open yourself up to, if you will, the, the, the outcome, new information, the outcome which you, you would prefer. Okay. You do that little bit of reframing. That's sometimes all the ABC model is. It's just looking at the same thing, but maybe looking at it from different perspectives. Gives you a little bit of control. You also learn to identify your reactions. Because sometimes you think of our reactions, or especially trauma reactions. We often talk about fight or flight. There's, there's different ones we do. In a long-term abusive, controlling, coercive relationship, a lot of our responses, again, I think, have been programmed into us. There were times when we stood up for ourselves. There's times when we said no. But again, they behave as if this is the cruelest thing anyone could ever do with them. So what we do is we back down. Fight or flight, at its most simple. Sounds a bit graphic, but punch it in the face or run for your life. That's pretty much it. <laughs> you know, Punch it in the face doesn't have to be violent, by the way. It could mean standing your ground. It could mean becoming aggressive, but that's just the way I phrase it. There is also fawning especially if we fear the other person is much more powerful than us. They are bigger than us. They are physically stronger. They have everyone in their corner cheering them on. Whatever it is I do, it, they're, they're going to wipe me out. This is going to be too powerful. Fawning is be its friend and it won't hurt you. Be nice to it and it won't hurt you. That's fawning. There's also freeze. Sometimes it's like, you know, the rabbit in the headlights. We don't know what to do. We're just frozen to the spot i think that's a little bit like the dinosaurs in jurassic park if you will don't move can't see if you don't move just stay perfectly still we're frozen to the spot sometimes in fear sometimes in terror and then there is for want of a better term play dead it hurts less if you don't fight back a lot of the time very aggressive abusive people they teach us in their, the ways they behave, it hurts less if you don't fight back. Just give them what you want. Give them what they want. So we have different reactions. So look at those reactions and pay attention to those reactions. Because again, coming out of that, you might be in a different situation. Say that workplace environment, the boss is giving you a hard time. But not without, they're not being cruel. They're not being hard. It's just that maybe you did something wrong and there's going to be a lot of consequences. And they might be a bit angry, but they're not angry at you. They're angry at what happened. But we find ourselves acting the way we would have with that person. Or maybe a new person that we're with. We do something that really upsets them and offends them. And we're acting in a way that we would have if the last person had behaved like that. So pay attention and learn to identify the different reactions we have. Sometimes it might be the best course of action. It could be the normal one. It could be the, the right one. It depends. Other times, as I said, the, you know, the reality check in with yourself. Perhaps we're overreacting. Yesterday's threat might not be the same as we think it is. It might be something entirely different. Learn to address what those triggers are and ways to do that. I mean, ideally in therapy, you can learn to do this. If you're trying to do it by yourself or if you're part of a group or whatever, when you learn to identify your triggers, sometimes journaling can help. I call it a mood diary. A lot of people call it journaling. I call it a mood diary, not because we're writing down our moods. You just write whenever the mood takes you, you know, whenever, you, whenever you're in the mood. But what you write is you write down what happened. You write down what you were thinking. You also write down how you were thinking. You write down what you were feeling. You also write down how you were feeling, how you were feeling it. We feel things physically. Again, we have physical triggers as well. And then you write down what is it you do. Now, maybe not straight away, the second, maybe the third time, who knows. But eventually you're going to start recognizing patterns. What happened might not be the same thing, but it could be the same recurring kind of thing. It could be you're challenged. It could be you're insulted. 
It could be your friend. It could be something unexpected happens. It could be plans have to change. It could be anything. When you start to learn the recurring themes of what your triggers are, you have something to start disarming. Then you write down, as I say, what you're thinking, but also how you're thinking, because we all have different thinking habits. We catastrophize, we mind read, we jump to conclusions based on how we feel. We predict the future. We label good or bad, right or wrong. We emotionally reason sometimes. It's true because I think it. It's true because I feel it. When you get a sense of not just what you're thinking, but how you're thinking, you have something to challenge. You have something to reframe. And I went through reframing questions as well in, in a previous one, if you want to check that out. But what you're feeling and how you're feeling it. Again, you go that little bit deeper. I feel excited. I feel threatened. I feel confused. I feel disrespected. I feel whatever it is. And because then you've got something to, to regulate. How are you feeling it? I have knots in my stomach. I have tension in my joints. I have a headache. Because sometimes we will get a physical reaction. And the physical reaction, I think it's quite common with things like anxiety and panic attacks. We feel the physical. The breath starts to change. Our chest starts to tighten. Um, our breathing becomes very shallow. We start to sweat. We start to shake. And that in itself it exacerbates the panic. When we get a sense of how we're feeling it as well, we maybe have something we can do. There's maybe ways that we can burn off excess energy. And I talked you through a, a, an exercise, a way of passively getting rid of unwanted energy. I'll just go through it very quickly with you again. You find yourself a quiet spot. There's no one around. It's not a spectator sport. People look at you oddly. Find yourself a quiet spot and you stand at arm's length from the wall. You place your hands up against the wall with your feet apart and you push the whole way up through your legs, up into your stomach, up into your shoulders and into the wall. You press the whole way through your body. And as you're doing it, you try to visualize tension, fear, anger, whatever it is, just traveling along your arms and disappearing into the wall. It's just dissipating into the wall. The wall can take it. If you get uncomfortable, if you get sore, change position, take a break. Goodness sake, don't hurt yourself. But as you're pushing and as you're imagining these things dissipating into the wall, you pay attention. Don't force anything, but just pay attention to anything different you begin to feel physically. A lot of times knots in our stomach start to shift. Things like that. We start to feel an ease. In the absence of the energy, sometimes what we're dealing with can be a little bit easier. So you find different ways to address those triggers. Let's say journaling, mood diary can be mood diary can be helpful to identify and then to find ways to deal with it there is also as i say you can go for a brisk walk you do the wall thing you do star jumps if you want you know whatever it is where's to try to get rid of the physical side of it the last thing is what is it you do because if you pay attention what you do does it just avoid it does it make it better or does it make it worse when you have your own handwritten evidence, you're in a better position to be able to do something about it, to do something with it. You have a bit more control that often things like, you know, abusive people lead us to believe we don't have. You know, anxiety would lead us to believe we don't have. We have more control than we give ourselves credit for. Another way of dealing with our triggers is changing from being problem focused to being problem solving. What is the outcome you would prefer? What are your resources? What are your options? What are your choices? What's your support network like? If you don't know what to do, who do you think might? Might be able to advise you. You find different ways of solving the problems as opposed to trying to just avoid them. I said earlier, some problems are worth avoiding. Other times, they might just make things worse. You learn the emotional regulation, as I say, what it is I'm actually feeling. Do your grounding exercises. Practice these things. Be prepared to get them wrong. Be prepared. You're not going to get it right the first time. But keep on practicing them. Find what works for you. Not everything's going to work for everybody. You find what works for you. If you're in a situation, and this means take by the way, 
if you're in a situation and is triggering you by what they're doing, by what they're saying, you don't necessarily have to tell them, hey, you're triggering me. You can tell them, I don't like what that is. I don't like what you're saying. I don't like how that feels. I don't like, you know, I'd rather you spoke to me this way and not use that language. Because they might be open to it. They might not have known they were hurting you or offending you or upsetting you. They might not know that. And they might be open to change. If you're with yet another person who has just found out a button to push. Oh, this upsets them. So I will keep on doing it. Then that's how you address your boundaries. And that's what I'm going to look more in depth at next time. Boundaries, different kinds of boundaries and how to reinforce them. That becomes your boundaries. Now your boundaries, having, having a boundary is one thing. So I often say, if we don't reinforce them, if we don't show there are consequences, they're going to keep on crossing them anyway. But have that calm, open dialogue with them. I don't like it when you treat me like that. I don't, as I say, they might be open to it because they didn't know they were hurting you. But if not, let's say, that's a conversation for another time. <laughs> Updating our memory. How do we update our memory? Now, there's different ways we can do that. I think, I wouldn't say it's the easiest way, but I think the most obvious way. If you look at where you are, remember what I said earlier on, yesterday's situation, yesterday's threat is present today. That's what we feel. That's what we believe because of the emotional impact of it. That person's right back here. That person's doing the same thing again. That person's pushing the same buttons. If you look at where you are today and how you are today, now you might be in a better position. You might be in a financially worse position. You could be whatever it is. You might just even be in a different position. But one way or another, you look at where you are today. It's like if this happened 10 years ago, if you were to look at yourself in the mirror, you probably see your hairstyles change. If you're like me, you're having to wear glasses and your hair's went gray. You're looking at how you are today, where you are today. You look different. You might sound a bit different. You're in a different environment. It could be a different job. When you look at where you are today, you're also looking at your support network because it might be different. You might still be feeling the pain of people who abandoned you in favor of whoever it was, but you, you look at your support network today because there could be people in support groups. They could be people, a new friend group. They could be friends you've reconnected with that maybe you weren't allowed to see you look at maybe where you're living you might be in the same place but it might look different maybe you've redecorated there are always little differences you look at where you are today you're updating your memory okay and the job might be different your diet may have changed you may have changed your hairstyle you even those small little changes you're not right back there you know, the example, I'll, I'll give you an example of updating our memory. Don't often give a lot of personal examples, but you're in for one tonight. I worked in a place many years ago, okay? Again, back when I had dark hair and didn't need glasses. I worked in a place and there was a manager there who was just horrible. Um, I don't know anybody in the UK, you might be familiar with his character. He was a real life Alan Partridge. He, he was just obnoxious. But I, it was an open plan office and his office was off to the side. And I remember going in one day and he just came out of his office and he tore strips off me. He went through me for a shortcut. To this day, I've still no idea what about. It was just nonsense. I Maybe I was the wrong colored socks or something. Um, but he was venomous and he was vindictive. He was really, really horrible. And I stood there frozen to the spot. Again, freeze. The rabbit in the headlights. I had no idea what to do or say. Completely stuck to the spot. What made it worse for me was afterwards, people would come over to me and go, hey, that was a bit rough, wasn't it? It was worse because they just told me that all heard it. You know, so my, my embarrassment had really went through the roof. But I remember talking that over with my therapist. This was a few years later. I was talking about the things that had bothered me, the situations had been, and I outlined that and what happened. And one of the things that really bothered me was I stood there and I did nothing. I didn't answer back. 
And she asked me kind of questions. A lot of therapists ask. I could sometimes ask my clients that the same questions. She just asked me to put myself back in that situation when he was tearing strips off me. And just to hang out there for a second and pay attention to what I was feeling physically, emotionally, what I was thinking of and so on. Then she just asked me, who did he remind you of? What age did you feel? When have you felt like that before? And what suddenly came up for me, I felt like I was about 10 years of age and the teacher was shouting at me in front of the class. 10 years of age, you feel you're helpless, you're powerless, there's nothing you can do. And that's what it was like. In that moment, I was triggered. I was just, I was the 10 year old again. Updating my memory is recognizing I am not a 10 year old anymore. I still don't like getting shouted at, who does? But I'm an adult, I can answer back. I don't have to raise my voice. And you know what? I can even just leave. I don't have to put up with that. There's different ways we can update our memories. When we're not updating our memories, it's like part of us is always stuck there. And that's why I think we often keep going through the same things again. We keep reacting the way we always did. We will freeze. We will run. We will fawn. We will play dead. We will fight as hard as we can. When we understand what's going on with us, as much as what the actual trigger is, what it brings up in us, it can be more effective, we can be more effective at how we deal with it. As I say, this is going to be a lot easier if you have maybe a therapist or a support group. I can only give you general, general ideas. Something that can help, again, not just the update in your memory part, but your own self-care, looking after yourself, doing things that are in your own best interest, not things that are necessarily going to cause pain and misery to others. That's when we're getting into the realms of selfishness. But your own self-care, your own self-interest, that could be, you know, um, you have the kind of meal you want. That could be practicing your meditation. That could be reading up on information. That could be just hanging out with your friends. The little things you do to look after yourself, okay? The, you know, it could be the journaling even. That's a form of self-care because what you're doing is you're building up your own handwritten evidence so that you can recognize the recurring themes and the triggers and the recurring themes in your reactions so that you can learn to respond a bit better. You also, you can also look at when it comes to control, when it comes to our triggers, I don't think we always necessarily get rid of our triggers and that's maybe that's not a bad thing because they are there to inform us. If we could get rid of them, if we could just forget about them, what would stop the same things happening again? Again, we, we allow them to inform us. Finding a therapist can be a big help. Some people prefer life coaching. It's a different thing, but some people prefer that. Support groups can be helpful. Um, even forums like this. Now, I've been trying to talk more. I keep scanning over to see the messages. Um, I'm going to have a look at them and see if there's questions I might be able to answer. But I just knew that if I did that throughout this, just like I've done in previous ones, I would lose my train of thought. So I'm trying to stay, stay focused. When you have some kind of support, even if that's just a friend group, it doesn't have to be a support group, even a friend group, people that bring out the best in you, people that care about you. Um, if you think about being in that relationship with that person, there was a lot of isolation went on. You were led to believe it was bad to talk to people or to be with people, especially people that they didn't like. Coming out of that, sometimes being with other people can help you to recover. You're not so alone. You're not so isolated. People are not necessarily going to agree with everything. They're not necessarily going to understand everything. And you're under no obligation to tell them anything anyway. They don't have to know. It's entirely up to you whether you share your story or not. But connecting with others can be another way to help you in the sense that you can challenge someone, you can disagree with someone, you can say no to someone, and you recognize their reaction is completely different. They're fine with it. They might be upset. They might be disappointed but they're not angry and they're not trying to coerce you. So if you will, you're undoing that kind of trigger. You're, you're learning not everybody is like that. And it is another way of updating your memory. So 
I've pretty much covered everything I can cover tonight when it comes to triggers. I've looked at what they are, the external stimuli, the things they can bring up in us, and the way toxic manipulative people sort of plant things in us so that they can trigger us later on. I just prefer, I call them buttons. They, but they know what buttons to push because they put the buttons there in the first place. And unwillingly, unknowingly, sometimes we have given them those buttons because we have shared really private, intimate things with people that we trusted. It's not that we did anything wrong. It's just that we're not capable of mind reading. That's all. So I'm going to have a quick look at some of the questions. I'm going to have to scroll back a bit and let's have a look. Hello, everybody. Uh, yeah, good road signs diverge from a that's a uh, DJH record hound. After therapy, triggers are a great road signs you can use to divert you from a potentially bad crash. That is a very good way of putting it. If you think of the trigger, um, yes. If it's not in your best interest, you can avoid it. I'll think about the Titanic and the iceberg. If you can see the iceberg far enough away, by all means, avoid it. Other times, you just have to hit the bloody thing head on. Otherwise, you might sink. You know, a bit graphic that, but, you know, it's. I think it's a useful way of looking at it. Um, hello from South Wales. People keep calling me a doctor. I'm not a... I am the... See, next time I get called doctor, I'm wherever it is. I'm going to pull out my sonic screwdriver. I am the doctor, not a doctor. I'm a time lord. Hello from Ireland. Uh, let me see. Certain smells triggering. Yeah, brings you back to terrifying experiences. That is not uncommon. A lot of people in combat, a lot of people who have been through fires, uh, a lot of people have been through um, natural sort of disasters, have found certain smells, you know, things like things burning, for example. That can bring something up. Absolutely. It's a sensory thing. For other people, it can be a taste. Uh, a, a, not an uncommon one, uh, loud sounds. If someone has been in a violent environment, a loud bang, a, lo a loud bang can, you know, send someone, it's the, the right back there, they're waiting for the threat. They think it might be a, it might be someone banging something really hard on a deck, they're about to hit them. It might be a bomb going off, could be a gunshot. The loud sound can, trigger that sort of thing as well the thing about updating your memory is when we start to do that we start to understand our triggers and so on the next time the door slams yes we're going to jump but we'll recognize everybody else in the room jumped as well it was an unexpected sound nothing else so when we are updating our memory when we learn to identify our triggers rather than leaping straight to a hundred and going into survival mode, if you will, we might leap to maybe a 10 or a 20, maybe even a 30. And that's what I mean. It's not necessarily a bad, I, it's not a, not, not, let me start that again. It's getting too late for me. It's not necessarily a good thing to get rid of these. Someone said earlier, they're good road signs to avoid something. But other times they are good road signs because they can inform us. Um, the road sign might say slippy road ahead or hell ahead. So we know what to do. We know to change gear. We know to slow down. So there's different ways of looking at the triggers. Uh, again, what else have we got? Mentioned the cranberries again. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see. Great visual. Talon in the back is great visual for this. Okay. Uh, yeah. Social media defame me. It's very common. Um, social media, it has its pluses, it has its downsides as well. A lot of things get put out there on social media and people not knowing the full story tend to take that for granted. But I'm going to give you a story about social media. Before the lockdown, I went to a training event where someone was talking about how social media is used to guilt trip and shame and all the rest of it and, and to coerce and, you know. And they were showing screenshots of messages. I think it was Facebook, I'm not sure. But, um, you know, all the names and dates and things, it was it was all anonymized. There was nothing there. But someone had mentioned that, you know, there had been a picture and it said, this is my grandson. He's going to be two tomorrow. And it breaks my heart. I'm not allowed to see them. Now, there were a lot of people saying, oh, that's awful. I'll message you and how are you getting on? And, you know, that's a disgrace. You're their grandmother. You should be able to see them. And they were getting all the sympathy in the world. 
until one person asked, why, what did you do? <laughs> and within minutes of someone asking that question, the post was taken down. But it, I thought that was a good example about people using social media to put their own narrative across. It's very rarely a balanced narrative. Just one of the things I said in the video about managing the adorable, sometimes we have to come off social media or we block the people that maybe associate with them because that fear of other people's opinions and what they might be saying, uh, it hurts like hell when your character is being assassinated. But we can't really do anything about it. And no matter how we defend ourselves, they've probably already made their mind up. Maybe avoiding that, that kind of trigger is not necessarily a bad idea. Uh, is it possible we can subconsciously look for similar damaging partners or situations? We attract this type of person. Uh, I've had no other relationships that aren't abusive. There is something. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say we go looking for Maybe some people do. I think everybody's different. I think we might have a recurring theme where we maybe look for someone who we can fix, someone we can rescue, or maybe someone we think or hope might rescue us. I think they're the kind of things that can go on. Some people, there may be things like codependency going on. There may be different kinds of trauma bonding going, trauma bonding going on. Um, there could be something in that, but it's never a one size fits all answer. There could be many different reasons for that. Uh, let me see, fight, flight, freeze, fawn. Yeah, we've got that. Uh, Trust you absolutely anytime. Overwhelmed, I went swimming. Three years ago, a severe injury, I should still recover. I'm pretty sure I would have left the north before. There are some things keep us there, and it could be an injury. It could be financial issues. It could be the children. There's a lot of different reasons why we stay. I think it's one of the most unfair questions. Now, I did put it in a title of a video. Why did you stay? I think it's. it can be an innocent question. But it's also a question that suggests the person did something wrong. Um, there's a lot of different reasons why people stay. Some people stay, they stayed because of the children. Sometimes I ask them to reframe that. Maybe you stayed for the children, and that's different. Other times, they might have all the resources. They might have all the money, their name. They could have racked up loads of debt in your name. If you leave, that debt's coming with you. It's your name that's on it. Dark personality types, when you think of the Machiavellian side, the manipulative side, the duplicitous scheming side, to say they know what they're doing. Um, we're, we're not born with a gift of hindsight. We're not, we're also, we're not clairvoyant. We don't often see it and they can be very, very convincing. Uh, let me say, learning to identify my triggers. That's a really good way of putting it, gamer girl. Identifying triggers. Learning to identify red flags doesn't mean there's a carnival in town. And even if there is a carnival in town, you're right, it's not necessarily a challenge to us. It could just be that's who they are. They're just going to look for anybody, any any kind of attention whatsoever. And let's see. There's a lot to get through here. It's the thing that I try to keep up. Boundaries are safe with safe people. Yeah, people who respect your boundaries. And these are the kind of people, when you come out of a situation like that, the kind of people that are going to help you to recover, that shows you not everyone is like them. Not everyone is like that group of people. There are good people in the world. There are decent people in the world. Everybody has their faults. Everybody has their flaws. But not everybody is malicious not everyone is unkind not everyone is cruel some people are just uninformed some people are mistaken um, and some people just disagree that does not necessarily mean they're wicked and they're out to hurt us that indication i said about you look for repeated patterns of behavior even if they are difficult even if they are disagreeable they respect your boundaries they respect your privacy and they respect you as a human being Okay, that's a good indicator that they keep doing that. True boundaries are us, it's what we are. Mm -hmm. And let me see, I'm coming to the one. I'm working on, don't want to hear any more about the victim. 
Machiavellian and Don Giovanni. Yeah, I found out recently that that's where the term comes from. So I thought it was like a Dickensian word. You know? It's good that we learn something new all the time. Um, glad you've removed myself from the dating pool in 2016. Focus on my own baggage. It's the thing about moving on. Uh, focusing on our own baggage. Some people find it helpful. They find it okay. They want to date, but they don't necessarily want something romantic. They just want to associate. They want to get involved. They want to go for a coffee. They want to get to know opposite members, you know, members of the opposite sex, same sex, whatever. It depends on what kind of relationship it is. They just want to meet other people. And they're fine with that because it could just be company. And some people go on dates and it just turns out to be a friendship. There's nothing romantic there. I think you know when you're ready. Jumping straight into something, it's not for me to say, but maybe it's not a good idea because we are bringing a lot of stuff with us. I think after we've maybe done a bit of work on ourselves, we've got to know ourselves a bit better, we feel a bit more comfortable with ourselves and maybe ready to move forward, then we can maybe do that a uh, little bit of dating, get to know people, one or two coffees, whatever it is, chats via text, but whatever it is. It doesn't, we're not actually committing to anything long term, but you know when you're ready. Um, you'll get a sense of that. And it doesn't matter whether it's a fortnight or whether it's five years. It doesn't matter how long it takes. I always say recovery is not a race. It's a journey. You'll get a sense of when you feel ready to move forward, if that means um, getting involved with a new person. Finding it hard to trust again. Yeah. When we find it hard to trust, given what you've been through, you know, your trust is taken for granted. Um, you're betrayed time and time again. You're lied to, you're lied about. It can be difficult to trust again, but not impossible. We can learn to trust. We're not necessarily going to trust the way we used to. We're not going to be completely open. We're not, we're not going to share everything. We're just going to, if you will, we would trust little pieces at a time. And whoever it is or whoever they are, they can show us whether or not they are worthy of being trusted more. Just like we will do in other people's lives. You meet a stranger for the first time. They're not going to give you their front door key. They're not going to tell you their most intimate secrets. Probably. Um, the more you get to know each other, the more we start to share things. And that's trust being built. We just don't leap straight in with trusting someone wholly. And I think we can be cautious, which is different from, if you will, not trusting completely. We can be cautious, and that's not a bad thing. Sometimes being a little more cautious can actually help us in our recovery. It's when we become too cautious and almost everything is a threat. That's, again, when triggers start to be high. That's when they start to exacerbate. They start to you know, become greater. Um blind trust is blind sixth sense amelia blind trust is blind i think that's a fair point yeah um can we ever fully trust anybody we trust people yeah we will we'll trust our doctor we'll trust our family we'll trust you know those closest to us but there are some things we won't share with them and that's our privacy you know we think of our privacy much as you much as we might trust someone we might not necessarily tell them everything about us I don't think we can ever fully, blindly trust anybody. Yeah, we can respect people. Absolutely. We can respect. There's nothing wrong with respect. You know, we don't have to like someone. We can still respect them. They're a human being. We might not respect their behavior. We might not respect their character. We might not respect certain things about them and what they do. But we can still respect the fact that they're a living, breathing human being. Still different levels of respect. Uh, found it reactive use has meant that other mental health professionals don't understand and says there must be forgiveness we ever do that when it comes to forgiveness I think that's a very difficult one forgiveness is a very difficult concept and I think the reason why is because maybe we confuse forgiveness forgiving does not mean forgetting they are two completely different things and when we think of forgiving, we also think we're just going to welcome someone back with open arms. Now, it can mean that. 
but it doesn't have to. I prefer to use the term letting go. It's not that we necessarily forgive that person and they're okay. Well, everything that they did to us, as painful as it hurts, I'm going to forgive them. I'm going to welcome them back. We're going to be best friends again. I would use the term letting go. I'm just going to let them go. And when I let them go, all I mean is they're not going to waste any more of my time. They're not going to consume any more of me. I am not going to have them run around in my head endlessly while I try to figure them out. No, I've got other places to put my energy. I'm still going to be angry when I think about them. I'm still going to be upset when I think about them. All of that, nothing's changed that way. But I'm not going to be consumed by them anymore. It also means I am not allowing them back in. If they do have to come in, they will come so far, and that's far enough. They will not get any further. Forgiveness is a difficult. I think when we talk about forgiveness, we often think of the spiritual, religious kind of forgiveness, and it can mean that. It doesn't have to. It doesn't have to. And I think, again, forgiveness is, is it's what it means to us. Doesn't mean it didn't happen doesn't mean it doesn't matter, doesn't mean it doesn't hurt, doesn't mean they get off scot-free, doesn't mean any of those things, doesn't have to mean any of those things. Uh, let's see, I trust is still one of my major problems, caution is very hard for me to learn, especially after betrayal by a mental health professional. That's whatever was happened there, uh, re record hound, not sure what happened there, whatever the betrayal is, it would betrayal from anybody, from someone you love, from someone you trust, um, from someone you were depending on, relying on. Yeah, it can be very difficult to rebuild that trust. What I mean by cautious is, again, we're not necessarily, we're not necessarily putting ourselves wholly in somebody's hands. We're not giving them all of our secrets, whatever now, um, depending on the person, depending on the role. That Again, that can be very difficult and I'm not really sure how to do this in the next few minutes, but being cautious doesn't mean we're being overly guarded. Being cautious means we're maybe just being careful with what we're sharing and with who. Hard to forgive someone who isn't sorry. Absolutely, that's the biggest thing about forgiveness. Unless the person actually acknowledges it, how can you forgive them? Which is why I prefer to use the term letting go. You leave them alone, you let them go. They are what they are. Nothing we're going to do is going to change them. When we think of letting go, because they've hurt us, because we have been in a close relationship, an intimate relationship, uh, what was supposed to be a loving relationship, they were supposed to have our backs. It hurts like hell that the person you trusted is the person that hurt you. And it hurts even worse that the person you were supposed to trust is the person who hurt you, and they won't acknowledge it. Again, I'll look at this more in depth next time. That's when things like our boundaries come in, not just having boundaries, recognizing what they are, being able to identify them within ourselves so that we can tell them to other people, but also recognizing there are consequences to boundaries being crossed. Now, I don't mean we go out at hell for leather. I don't mean we turn into one of the Avengers or something. Um, but unless we show some kind of consequence, people are going to continually cross them, no matter how many times we state them. Uh, Intrusive questions, big red flag, no answer required. Yeah. If you find a question is too intrusive, you're under no obligation to answer it. That's why I think sometimes the broken record method, you say, no, I won't be discussing that, and they keep on going. That's why I said someone seemed to get a laugh out of this the other day. I mentioned it in the video. You use your best customer care tone of voice. So in other words, it's emotionless. You just repeat the same thing in your customer care tone of voice. I will not be discussing that. I will not be discussing that. I will not be discussing that. It doesn't matter what they come back with. Remember, they're trying to, if they've planted triggers in you, they've got your buttons to push. They're going to be trying to push them. You just keep saying the same thing in your customer care tone of voice. If not, they're going to be trying to plant triggers in you. But I can't trust you unless me, well, that's your... That's your decision, that's your choice. I can't make that for you. 
we just keep giving it back to them keep repeating the same thing what can you do if you've been abused and discarded but you can't help loving your abuser audrey that is a question that has come up over the past year at least six times on my channel because i make videos based on what people ask and i can't always answer them straight away um sometimes i try to answer as many questions in the one video um and sometimes i have to give myself a kick because i'm embarrassed because the question was asked maybe six months ago and i'm only getting around to it now i'm only one person and there's a lot of requests but that question has come up a lot and that is something i am going to be putting out within the next maybe not the next video but the one after that that part of us that still feels enmeshed that part of us that still feels as if we love them um it's that part of us that's still stuck there and part of addressing that is updating our memory what i will say to you if it's of any help i don't think and everybody's different i'm just being very general i don't think it's them that we loved it's the version of them they presented to us it's the version of them that we fell for it's the version of them we want to get back it's the version of them that was presented that we loved not the real them just like the end of the relationship whenever we come up we grieve the relationship and grieving is, is human nature we grieve things it's like a bereavement we grieve the person we grieve the relationship we are grieving the relationship we would have liked to have had the one that we were promised the one that we tried very hard to get that's if you will that's the part of us that's stuck now i could be wrong because sometimes it is the person but i think more commonly it's not it's the version of them that we fell in love with that version that's gone that version that could they could bring it back if they wanted but it would be a false more often than not it's it's their false sense it's false self it's the part of them that if you will reeled you in in the first place but listen kind of went on a little bit later than i normally do um i just noticed my camera's getting red here so it means it's going to overheat in a second um i hope you find this evening helpful uh as always i can just be very general i can't really go into specific details about specific um situations and people also when i'm just being very general these are things that maybe if you are seeing a therapist or or whoever you're in a support group there are things you can work on a lot better there are things that those people um can support you with these are just to give you and this is just to give you information so that you can maybe understand yourself and understand things a little bit better so as always as i hope you find this helpful uh tried to catch up with as many questions as as i could the next time i know i put that um i put the the the, the poll out and everybody wanted me to do all three and i left it to this one so this time it was the triggers um so next time i will talk about the boundaries i'll i'll let you know now i will talk about the boundaries what boundaries are how we recognize them in ourselves even in other people um the different kinds of boundaries because there's more than just one boundary um how we communicate those boundaries and again how we reinforce them if we have to again we don't have to go out we don't have to draw our sword and run at them you know that's not how we reinforce there's different ways we can reinforce so i often say there is a difference between assertive and aggressive huge difference so we'll we'll look at that and the other thing i was going to say a couple of people have mentioned this is a weekday night uh, for me anyway this is a wednesday night it's 8 p.m here in the uk i'm aware that a lot of people are are watching me from different parts of the world there's people from australia there's people from america there's people from different parts of europe um somebody from thailand earlier on i saw on the messages um and what they asked was you know if i could change the time a bit because it's a because it's a working day uh for a lot of people they're going to be in work while, while this is happening or maybe they're just about to bed or maybe they're just about to go to bed or, or whatever it's it's because of the the world and it's time it's time for how would it be if i was to make it the same time it would be eight o'clock but if i were to make it on a sunday instead of a wednesday would that be easier for everyone so i'm just gonna have a quick look to see 
uh, if that if people would find that helpful. That way you're not having to worry about getting out of work or getting home from work or maybe having to do the catch up viewing. Um, yeah, Sunday would work. Okay, no, that's one for Sunday. Um, hopefully other people will find. So what? No, okay, Cody, son, it wouldn't work for you. Thanks for all, thanks for all your videos. Losing my mind. Sunday's fine. Sunday's fine. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read the question or the comments afterwards. Um, just to see what suits. I try to get a consensus. Unfortunately, what I can't do is I can't suit everybody. I can't please everybody, but I'm. I will try to do my best to accommodate as many people as possible. Um, so until next time, thanks for watching. And do me a favor. Don't forget. I keep forgetting to do this. This is why my channel is the way it is. Um, do me a favor. Don't forget to leave a little comment and, and to click like on the thing. And, and that way other people can get to see it too. Um, I really need to do a course in social media because I still don't know what i'm doing <laughs> everybody as always it's been really nice um i hope you got something from this and until next time thanks for watching